Imagine, just imagine going back in time to ancient Rome. You grab a cup of, well, let's call it wine, with Emperor Marcus Aurelius himself. Okay, I like where this is going. And we're not strategizing for battle here. We're talking leadership. From the guy who practically invented stoicism while running an empire. Exactly. So in this deep dive, we're going right to the source, Aurelius's writings. Plus, we've got this awesome article, 12 Lessons on Leadership from the Last Great Emperor, as our roadmap. I'm ready. Let's do it. Get ready to have your leadership game completely upended. Okay, so this article, it makes this mind-blowing link between those top-notch sports captains and, get this, stoic principles. Interesting. I'm intrigued. Think about it. The captains who always lead their teams to victory, they've got this, this certain something. They do, don't they? It's more than just skill. Way more. Turns out a lot of it lines up perfectly with core stoic values. Okay, I can see where you're going with this. <laughs> so we're talking about the inner game, the mental toughness. You got it. And that applies whether you're on the court or, well, in the boardroom, right? Absolutely. And what's really fascinating is how these traits, identified in the pressure cooker of professional sports, are pure gold for any leader, anywhere. Mm -hmm. Take the first one the article digs into, focused. Aurelius considered this a must-have, like an essential epithet for the self. Epithet for the self. I like that. So it's not just something you do. It's like part of who you are. Exactly. And think about it, whether it's a basketball point guard in the last seconds of a game or a surgeon in the middle of a complex operation, that laser focus, that's what lets them perform under crazy pressure. It's like they've got those blinders on, right? The rest of the world just fades away and they're locked in on the task at hand. 100%. And that's huge, not just in those do or die moments, but in our everyday leadership roles too. Because, let's be real, how often are we pulled in a million directions at once? Emails, meetings, deadlines, you name it. Constantly. It's a never-ending cycle. And in that chaos, the ability to shut out the noise, stay focused, that's what lets leaders make clear decisions and inspire their people. You said it. It's about leadership presence, really. And speaking of clarity, the article also highlights clear communication as a hallmark of these stoic captains. Makes sense. You can't inspire anyone if they have no idea what you're talking about. It's true. Mm -hmm. Think about those coaches who can take even the most complicated plays, break them down into simple steps that anyone can follow. That's a superpower in itself. Absolutely. Clear communication builds trust, empowers people. When you can articulate a vision so well that everyone's on board, that's leadership gold and it creates a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. People want to be part of something bigger than themselves, but they need to understand what that something is. Totally. And you know what? Sometimes leading with that kind of clarity means taking a stand, even when it's unpopular. Which brings us to courageous, another stoic captain trait. Because it takes guts to stand up for what you believe in, to challenge the status quo, to be a voice for your team, especially when it's hard. It does. We often picture courage as some big heroic act. But it's also those quieter moments, right? Oh, absolutely. The everyday courage. Having that tough conversation with a key member, pushing back against a bad idea, even if it ruffles some feathers. Speaking truth to power, that takes guts. And sometimes that courage looks like staying calm when everyone else is losing their minds. Which is easier said than done. Oh, for sure. Which brings us to controlled, another one of those stoic captain traits. It's not about being an emotionless robot, though. Definitely not. It's about not letting your emotions control you. Right. It's about emotional intelligence, knowing how you feel and how it affects others, and then making a conscious choice about how you respond. The article had this great anecdote about boxer Joe Louis. They called him the ring robot because he was so unflappable. I can see why. It must have been incredibly intimidating. Totally. It was like his opponents couldn't get to him, which in a way made him even more formidable. Because that calmness under pressure... It's a superpower. It shows everyone around you that you've got this, you've got a plan. It's that steady hand at the wheel energy, which can be so reassuring, especially when things are unpredictable. Speaking of unpredictable, how about we dive into how we handle those curveballs that life, or should I say leadership, throws our way? Because there's always a curveball, isn't there? Always. We go into projects, even relationships with certain expectations, and then bam, reality hits. It's human nature to crave certainty, to cling to our assumptions about how things should be. But that can make us resistant to new information, new ways of thinking, which can be a huge disadvantage for leaders. Because the world's always changing, right? Yeah. If we're not willing to adapt to change our minds when we learn something new, we get left behind. 100%. 
And Aurelius, he was all about questioning your biases, being open to the possibility that you might be wrong. He thought that was a sign of strength. Which is tough. No one loves admitting they were wrong. But it's so crucial for growth, especially as a leader. It's true. It's about being more committed to learning and truth than to being right all the time. That humility, that willing is to say, you know what? I don't have all the answers. That's powerful stuff. It really is, and it creates this culture where people feel safe speaking up, sharing their ideas, even challenging the way things are done. And that's how you get better outcomes. Absolutely. It's about fostering that growth mindset. So we've got staying focused, communicating clearly, being courageous, staying cool under pressure, and being open to change. We're like building the ultimate stoic leader, trait by trait. It's about developing that inner strength, that resilience that allows us to lead well, even when things get tough. Exactly. And that brings us to another biggie for Aurelius. Leadership is about service. Ooh, good one. So tell me more about this whole leadership as service idea. How did Aurelius view that? Especially from his perspective as, you know, the emperor, it's important to remember Aurelius was all about stoicism. This philosophy emphasized virtue, logic, living in tune with the natural order of things. Mm -hmm. So for him, leadership wasn't about power or status. It was about using your position to serve something bigger. Okay, I am hooked. Tell me more about how the service thing played out and how he led and how we can live that out even if we don't have emperor on our business cards. This is where it gets good. Aurelius compared a true leader to a grapevine. It produces grapes and doesn't make a big deal about it. It just does its thing. Exactly. Once the vine does its job, it doesn't brag, doesn't need a pat on the back, it just moves on to the next thing. I love that image. Just do the work, make a difference, and don't get caught up in the ego of needing credit. Exactly. Focus on the impact you want to make, on serving a purpose bigger than yourself. Okay, but how do we do that in the real world, in our workplaces? Because honestly, it's so easy to get caught up in that whole, look at me, look what I accomplished mentality. It's a real struggle. Social media doesn't help. It's about changing your perspective. Ask yourself, how can my skills and talents be used for something bigger than just me? It's about the bigger picture. I like it. Right. It could be mentoring someone, sharing what you know, uh. or tackling those thankless tasks that nobody else wants to do. But that need to get done, those behind the scenes actions, those unseen contributions, I bet they make a bigger difference than we realize. Absolutely. And here's the amazing part. When you lead with this service mentality, you find fulfillment in the action itself, not the accolades that come with it. You're not in it for the applause. You're in it because it's the right thing to do. There's real power in that. It's true. And it's something that Aurelius understood deeply. Okay, so we've talked about focusing our energy, clear communication, acting courageously, staying steady under pressure, being adaptable, and leading with the spirit of service. But there's this other piece of leadership, right? Ambition. Right. How do we reconcile that drive to achieve, to move up with this stoic ideal of service and humility? It seems like they would be at odds with each other. You would think so. And the article tackles this very tension by comparing Napoleon with this fascinating figure from American history, General William Tecumseh Sherman. Napoleon, I know. But Sherman, tell me more. What made him a great leader? Sherman was incredible during his time as a general in the Civil War. But his humility is what set him apart. Even with his massive success, he never let it go to his head. He was grounded, always willing to step back for the good of the team, even if it meant less recognition for him. So he had that quiet confidence that comes from knowing his own worth. He didn't need all the external validation. Precisely. And the article called Sherman Style Poise Not Pose, which I love. Okay, yes, Poise Not Pose. I need that broken down for me. So Poise is about that quiet confidence, that inner strength from knowing who you are and what you stand for. It's leading with humility, recognizing that you're always learning and growing. Makes sense. Pose is all about external validation, needing the approval and admiration from others, which, especially in leadership, can be a dangerous game. Because when your ego is in charge, you're more likely to make decisions based on what makes you look good, not what's best for everyone else in the long run. Exactly. And you become less open to feedback, less willing to admit when you're wrong, which stifles growth and innovation. It's like being so caught up in seeming perfect that you're terrified to take risks or say, I messed up. Right. And that fear can be paralyzing for you as a leader and for the people you lead. 
It's a recipe for disaster, both personally and professionally. So how do we develop that poise, not pose approach, especially in a world obsessed with titles, awards, and likes? It goes back to what we were saying, find your purpose, your why. When you know that, when you're driven by something bigger than yourself, it's easier to stay grounded, even when you're killing it. It's like having that North Star guiding you. Exactly. And that's what kept leaders like Sherman on the right path, even in the face of incredible success. It's about something deeper, something more meaningful than just chasing the next win or promotion. Exactly. And that's a lesson that's as relevant today as it was in ancient Rome. It really is. And it creates this culture where people feel safe speaking up, sharing their ideas, even challenging the way things are done. And that's how you get better outcomes. Absolutely. It's about fostering that growth mindset. So we've got staying focused, communicating clearly, being courageous, staying cool under pressure and being open to change. We're like building the ultimate stoic leader trait by trait. It's about developing that inner strength, that resilience that allows us to lead well even when things get tough. Which, speaking of tough, leads us right into another of Aurelius's big leadership principles, staying calm when the pressure's on. Oh, for sure. Because let's face it, leadership, it often means dealing with some pretty hairy situations. Definitely. Tight deadlines, those conversations that you just don't want to have, those moments when everyone's looking at you, expecting you to have the answer. And that's where Aurelius's ideas about keeping your emotions in check become pure gold. Right, like that Navy SEAL saying, calm is contagious. But that's, I don't know, that feels like more than just a catchy phrase, doesn't it? There's something really profound about how a leader carries themselves, how it impacts the entire team, especially when things are intense. Absolutely. Think about it. When you're leader, they stay calm, cool, collected in the middle of chaos. It sends a message. Exactly. It tells everyone else, we're okay, there's a plan, don't freak out. It creates the sense of stability, of confidence, which can be so powerful. It's huge. It can be the difference between falling apart and pulling together as a team. It's like that scene in Apollo 13. I don't know if you've seen it, but... Oh, yeah. The engineers are, like, losing it. But Gene Krantz, the flight director, cool as a cucumber. Total pro. And it radiates outward, you know? It reassures everyone, okay, we might be able to work through this crazy problem, even if it seems impossible. Right. And the Stoics, they had these techniques for actually building that calmness, which, guess what? They still work today. Oh, I like where this is going. Lay it on me. One of the big ones is focus on what you can control. So you're facing a challenge, right? First thing, take a step back. Ask yourself, what parts of this are actually within my power to change? Yeah. And what parts are totally out of my hands? It's about like not wasting energy, stressing over things you can't do a thing about, right? Exactly. Like, will that client go for the proposal? Who knows? Right. But you can control how well you prepare, how clear you are when you explain your ideas, how well you listen to their concerns. You focus on showing up as your best self, ready for anything. Exactly. And that shift from worrying to problem solving, that's where the power is. Instead of feeling stuck, you see opportunities to act, even in a mess. You're not just along for the ride, you're in the driver's seat, even if you can't control the traffic. Love that analogy. But it's more than just focusing on what you can control, isn't it? There's that whole stoic idea of reframing how you look at things. Absolutely. Don't think of challenges as these impossible roadblocks. See them as chances to learn and grow. It's subtle, but it makes a world of difference. It's that whole what doesn't kill you makes you stronger thing. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes it even makes you a better leader. Yeah. Because think about it. We learn so much more from our screw ups than our wins. If we let ourselves, you know. If we're open to it. But that willingness to learn, to adapt, that's key for any leader, especially in today's world. Things are changing constantly. It's the only constant, really. And something I find so interesting about stoicism is this idea that you shouldn't be afraid to say, you know what? I changed my mind. It's true. They were all about that. Aurelius saw that as strong, not weak. It takes a lot of courage to admit you are wrong. Because nobody likes to be wrong, right? Nobody. But there's something really freeing about letting go that need to be right all the time. So true. It lets you be open to new information, to hearing other perspectives. And ultimately, it helps you make smarter choices, which at the end of the day, that's what we're going for. That's the goal. And that openness, that willingness to learn from anyone, 
it's crucial for good leadership. It creates this environment of curiosity where people feel comfortable saying, hey, I've got a question, or what if we tried it this way? Instead of just blindly following the leader because, well, they're the leader. Right, questioning those assumptions. And Aurelius, he thought that was huge for both personal growth and, you know, becoming a better leader. Oh, absolutely. He was centuries ahead in recognizing how much our own thoughts our interpretations, even just our assumptions, how much they shape everything. It's like that saying, we don't see the world as it is, we see it as we are. Exactly. And sometimes the way we're seeing things, the assumptions we're holding on to, they're not doing us any favors. They could even be holding us back. Totally. And that's where this stoic idea of hypolepsis comes into play. Hypolepsis. Okay. okay. Another one for the vocabulary list. I know, right? But it's basically about the way our minds latch on to certain thoughts, certain perceptions, certain judgments. And we often don't even realize we're doing it. It's like it's happening on autopilot. Exactly. It's not just what's happening to us. It's how we're interpreting those events. Okay. So same event, different interpretations, totally different outcomes. Right. And the cool thing is we have the power to choose a different interpretation. We can find a perspective that's actually helpful, even when things are tough. So how do we do that? How do we recognize those unhelpful thoughts, those assumptions that are tripping us up and actually choose to see things differently? It starts with paying attention. Notice your thoughts, what you're saying to yourself, those knee-jerk reactions you have. What's the story you're telling yourself? What assumptions are you making? And are those stories, those assumptions, are they actually helping you be your best self? Love that. It's about asking those tough questions. And once you're aware of those not so helpful patterns, you can start to challenge them. So it's like, hold up brain, I see what you're doing, trying to drag me down that same old negative path. Not today, I'm choosing to look at this a different way. Exactly. You're recognizing that you have a choice, even when it feels like everything is out of your control. It's about reclaiming your power. Yes. You're not a victim of your circumstances. You get to choose how you respond. And you know, this idea of taking responsibility for our own thoughts, our own actions, it pops up again and again in Aurelius's writings. It's central to Stoicism. He thought it was the key to, you know, living a good life, a life that feels meaningful. Which makes sense, right? Yeah. If we're always pointing fingers, blaming everyone else for our problems, or feeling like we're just, I don't know, at the mercy of fate. You're never going to reach your full potential. Exactly. And you're definitely not going to be the best leader you can be. Because real leadership, it means taking ownership, not just for the wins, but for the missteps too. It's that the buck stops here mentality. 100%. Yeah. No more excuses. No more passing the buck. Own it. Learn from it. And figure out how to do better next time. And that takes humility. Courage. It does. It's not easy. But it's incredibly empowering. Because you were in the driver's seat. You're not just along for the ride. You're calling the shots. Exactly. And that shift from feeling like a victim to realizing, hey, I have the power to choose how I respond, that can be a game changer. So we're owning our stuff, staying calm under pressure, questioning those sneaky assumptions and rolling with the punches, adapting to change. But what happens when it all goes right? How do you stay grounded when you're on top? Because success can be just as disorienting as failure, maybe even more so. Absolutely. It's easy to lose yourself in the accolades. It's like that saying, be careful about getting too caught up in praise because people often praise what they wish they had, not what they actually see in you. Oof, that hits hard. So how do you keep your ego in check when things are going your way? Because it's easy to buy into your own hype, especially when everyone's telling you how great you are. It's true. It's easy to let it go to your head. It is. And that's when it's most important to stay connected to your values, to your why. Why are you doing this? What mark do you want to leave on the world? And when you look at it, are you letting success mess with those values? Is your ego getting so big that you're not serving that bigger purpose anymore? Man, those are some tough questions to ask yourself, especially when you're in a position of power or influence. Because those are the times it's easiest to get caught up in all the outward signs of success, the awards, the money, the fancy title, but you know, Real fulfillment, true leadership, that comes from something deeper. It does. It comes from knowing you're actually making a difference, that you're using your abilities to serve something bigger than yourself. It all comes back to Aurelius's big idea about leadership being service. It all connects, doesn't it? It's like you can have it all, the money, the fame, the corner office, but if you're not using those things to make a positive impact, then what's the point? Exactly. It's about finding that sweet spot between being ambitious and being humble. Hmm between going after excellence and staying true to your values. 
And I like how the article tied this all back to the idea of planning. Right. The Stoics were big planners. They were all about it, but not in a controlling the future kind of way. Right. More like being prepared for whatever comes your way. Because you can't actually predict what's going to happen, but you can be ready. Exactly. And planning. It doesn't need to be this complicated thing. Taking a few minutes each day to set your intentions, get clear on your priorities, visualize what you want to achieve, that can completely change how productive and effective you are. It's true. And it goes back to that saying, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. The article even mentioned Bill Walsh, the legendary football coach. Oh yeah, I remember reading about that. He was known for, get this, scripting the first 25 plays of every single game. Wow, talk about planning ahead. But when you think about it, in that environment, every decision, every play matters so much. Having a plan, it probably reduced a lot of stress, kept everyone focused. Absolutely. Instead of always reacting, they were prepared for anything. Exactly. Yeah. And we might not be coaching a Super Bowl team, but that same principle applies to our own lives, our own work. It's about creating structure, getting clear on what needs to happen. And that clarity, that's powerful, especially when everything feels chaotic. It's about making intentional choices instead of just reacting to whatever comes your way. Which, when you think about it, isn't that a big part of what leadership is? It is. Leadership is about those choices, big and small. How you show up, how you treat the people around you, the impact you want to make. And Aurelius, he truly believed that everyone, no matter what their title was, had the potential to be a leader. He did. And he believed that philosophy, especially Stoicism, was a powerful tool for developing those skills. Oh, 100% for developing the virtues and wisdom to lead well. Which is so interesting, right? Because sometimes philosophy can feel kind of, I don't know. Abstract. Yes, exactly, heady. But Aurelius, he lived it. He wasn't just a philosopher in theory, he was a philosopher running an empire. Exactly. He combined that deep thinking with real world action. That uh -huh. blend of wisdom and leadership, that's what makes him so fascinating even today. He walked the walk. It's like that Seneca quote, philosophy isn't meant to be studied, it's meant to be lived. In Aurelius, he embodied that. He did. And right. his writing, it's like this window into the mind of a leader facing a lot of the same stuff we are, even though he lived centuries ago. It's kind of mind blowing. It is. And it just goes to show these ancient ideas, they still resonate. This guy dealt with wars, plagues, political drama, you name it. And yet, his reflections on leadership, on how to live a good life, they're still so relevant today. It's incredible. And ultimately, I think that's what it comes down to. Aurelius was all about finding your purpose, leading with integrity, and striving to make a positive difference. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. And what I find so inspiring about Aurelius is that he believed everyone, no matter what their life looked like, had the potential to live with virtue, to live with meaning. That that potential for greatness is within all of us. Mm -hmm. We're willing to put in the work, you know, to cultivate those values, to lead with courage and compassion and wisdom. It's a powerful message. And it's as true today as it was all those years ago. It really is. So as we finish this deep dive into the mind of Marcus Aurelius, I want to leave you with this question. What leadership lesson from Aurelius really stuck with you? And how can you use that wisdom in your own life, your own work, your own way of showing up as a leader in the world? Keep thinking about it. And until next time, keep exploring, keep leading, keep becoming the best. Focus Aurelius, he ruled with grace. The stoic wisdom all up in his face. Kept his cool through the Roman storm With a calm that was fire Man was born to reform He said, mind your kingdom So take the throne Inner peace, that's what seeds are song uh -huh. When life's heavy, don't be rattled Keep your crew steady, never be battled Marcus, Marcus, stoic he knew the rhythm, kept it locked in time Yeah, Marcus, Marcus Philosophize in the funk of life He's wise in disguise In the heart of Rome, he kept his flow Through wars and trials, he'd never fold No way With thoughts like gold And so, so deep A funky emperor in wisdom he Life's a dance, she often say Step by step, don't give it away uh -huh. When chaos comes, take it in stride No 
Purpose as I started going through this journey, instead of looking at like, woe is me, God, man, why, why, man, why, why? I started looking at this, it's the perfect training ground. You knew exactly what you were doing. You put me in every situation possible to tell a story that needed to be told. People don't really understand what that is when you're in the worst environment possible, the worst situation possible, and everybody's looking like, God, man, I hope this ends. And you see that. Time slows down and you see that. You're you're feeling that. Everybody has that look on their face like, God, this gotta go. I don't want to be here anymore. And when I started realizing, I started playing mind games. And I was like, you know what? I bet these partners are looking at us, judging themselves about when they were going through Hell Week. About, let me see, I'm looking at Goggins right now. I was better than him. I was like, okay. Okay. You gotta judge me, right? <laughs> All right. So this is what I'm gonna do to you. They tell you how you're supposed to feel. You are feeling that way. I was like, ah, uh, don't let this mother tell you how you're supposed to feel. No, it's day one, mother. This is hour one. So I was getting my Boku all jacked up. I said, we're going to take these motherfuckers souls. So when they had us doing this simple thing that guys were struggling with, I looked on the instructor's faces and it looked like someone had just f with their soul. And I looked at my guys in my Boku and I said, hey, guess what? We <laughs> own space in their head. We own space. They're going to think about us tonight. We start fueling off the fact that, man, it takes one second of energy to steal everybody's. And then you have all the energy you need. That's all you need. You need to look at someone's eyes. You know how it is when you fight somebody and you broke that. He's like, oh, God, man, I know we're going to go back the next round. And you feel like, my God, I can fight all day. I can fight all mm. day long. That's what taking souls is. But you have to have the will, the heart, the courage to go that distance when you're exactly jacked up, you have nothing left. There is nothing impossible to him who will try. Learn as if you were not reaching your goal and as though you were scared of missing it. The greatest blessings of mankind are within us and within our reach. A wise man is content with his lot whatever it may be, without wishing for what he is not. Seneca Things are not always completely clear. You don't need to be right all the time. You learn nothing from life if you think you're right all the time. Act as if you are already a millionaire and you'll find yourself getting richer every day. Jack Canfield See, these are the words of a philosopher. This is the disposition of a man who will do good to others. Here is a man who has listened to discourses, who has read what is written about Socrates as Socratic, not as the compositions of Lysias and Socrates. I have often wondered by what arguments, not so, but by what argument. This is more exact than that. What, have you read the words at all in a different way from that in which you read little odes? For if you read them as you ought, you would not have been attending to such matters, but you would rather have been looking to these words, Enitus and Melitus, are able to kill me, but they cannot harm me, and I am always of such a disposition as to pay regard to nothing of my own except to the reason which on inquiry seems to me the best. Hence whoever heard Socrates say, I know something, and I teach. But he used to send different people to different teachers. Therefore they used to come to him and ask to be introduced to philosophy by him and he would take them and recommend them. Not so, but as he accompanied them he would say, Hear me today discoursing in the house of Quadratus. Why should I hear you? 
do you wish to show me that you put words together cleverly? You put them together, man. And what good will it do you? But only praise me. What do you mean by praising? Say to me. Admirable, wonderful. Well, I say so. But if that is praise, whatever it is, which philosophers mean by the name of good, what have I to praise in you? If it is good to speak well, teach me, and will praise you. What then? Ought a man to listen to such things without pleasure? I hope not. For my part, I do not listen even to a lute player without pleasure. Must I then, for this reason, stand and play the lute? Hear what Socrates says. Nor would it be seemly for a man of my age, like a young man composing addresses, to appear before you. Like a young man, he says. For in truth this small art is an elegant thing, to select words and to put them together, and to come forward and gracefully to read them or to speak. And while he is reading to say, There are not many who can do these things, I swear by all that you value. Does a philosopher invite people to hear him? As the sun himself draws men to him, or as food does, does not the philosopher also draw to him those who will receive benefit? What physician invites a man to be treated by him? Indeed, I now hear that even the physicians in Rome do invite patients. But when I lived there, the physicians were invited. I invite you to come and hear that things are in a bad way for you, and that you are taking care of everything, except that of which you ought to take care and that you are ignorant of the good and the bad, and are unfortunate and unhappy. A fine kind of invitation. And yet, if the words of the philosopher do not produce this effect on you, he is dead. And so is the speaker. Rufus was used to say, If you have leisure to praise me, I am speaking to no purpose. Accordingly, he used to speak in such a way that every one of us who were sitting there supposed that someone had accused him before Rufus. He so touched on what was doing. He so placed before the eyes every man's faults. The philosopher's school, ye men, is a surgery. You ought not to go out of it with pleasure, but with pain. For you are not in sound health when you enter. One has dislocated his shoulder, another has an abscess a third a fistula, and a fourth a headache. Then do I sit and utter to you little thoughts and exclamations that you may praise me and go away, one with his shoulder in the same condition in which he entered, another with his head still aching, and a third with his fistula or his abscess just as they were? Is it for this then that young men shall quit home and leave their parents and their friends and kinsmen and property? that they may say to you, Wonderful, when you are uttering your exclamations. Did Socrates do this, or Zeno, or Cleanthes? What then? Is there not the hortatory style? Who denies it? As there is the style of refutation, and the didactic style. Who then ever reckoned a fourth style with these, the style of display? What is the hortatory style? To be able to show both to one person and to many the struggle in which they are engaged, and that they think more about anything than about what they really wish. For they wish the things which lead to happiness, but they look for them in the wrong place. In order that this may be done, a thousand seats must be placed and men must be invited to listen, and you must ascend the pulpit in a fine robe or cloak, and describe the death of Achilles. Cease, I entreat you by the gods, to spoil good words and good acts as much as you can. Nothing can have more power in exhortation than when the speaker shows to the hearers that he has need of them. But tell me who, when he hears you reading or discoursing, is anxious about himself, or turns to reflect on himself, or when he has gone out says, the philosopher hit me well. I must no longer do these things. But does he not, even if you have a great reputation, say to some person, he spoke finely about Xerxes? And another says, no, but
but about the battle of Thermopylae? Is this listening to a philosopher? Courage to act. Part of being hungry when you've been defeated, it takes courage to start over again. I used to do door-to-door -door sales and 